Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started. It looks like there's a bunch of people online. I thank you so much for uh, taking time out to watch this. Um, if you've been seeing what's going on in the news the last several days, we've got this great conjunction of 2020. The news media has been hyping this all over the place. I've been seeing stuff on social media all over the place about it. Everybody's calling it the Christmas star because it's happening on the winter solstice. Um, because it's close to Christmas, this conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn, conjunction is just a fancy word that says that two objects in the sky are really close together. So Jupiter and Saturn are close enough in the sky. In, in the sky, uh, it's the it's not it's something that happens with fair amount of frequency. But uh, the closeness tonight is they are closer together tonight than they have been for about 600, 400 years. The 1600s is the last time it was this close together, but it was 800 years ago in 1200, the year 1200 or so, that they were visible this close at night. And they won't be doing anything like this again in our lifetime. So this is kind of a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity uh, to see these two things close. So everybody's excited about the fact that this is a Christmas star event. Uh, Google even has a great conjunction uh, Google Doodle for today, where Jupiter and Saturn come by and clap hands, give each other a high five. Uh, so this is a, a big deal as it's going on. In State College, Pennsylvania, where I'm broadcasting this from, it is entirely, completely heavily clouded up tonight, so we can't see a thing. But if I went out on the street, I have a lot of trees in my yard, so I'd have to go to an empty field somewhere to be able to see it. But this is what it would look like if I was out there. Jupiter and Saturn, just above, at, at uh, probably by now at 7.30, it's below the horizon in State College. But I went out about 6, about 5 and 6 o'clock tonight. It would have been just above the horizon after the sun went down. Jupiter and Saturn are close enough in the southwest part of the sky. Today they were close enough. They would almost look like they were touching in the sky. And if I zoom in with a, with a telescope, this is a virtual telescope, but if I zoomed in, you'd be able to see that they aren't actually touching. Um, they are very close together in the sky, though Jupiter and Saturn get close enough with this astronomy software. You can see the moons of Jupiter and the rings on Saturn. Uh, some of you probably have telescopes, but you can see this event yourselves. Um, this is a photograph that uh, I stole from my cousin Sharla. Um, she posted on a Facebook last week up in Saskatchewan, Canada. So you can see the two objects right here on the screen. Um, the two little bright objects is Jupiter and Saturn. My Aunt Marilyn from Saskatchewan sent me this picture this afternoon. Um, they took it uh, just after sunrise on Friday. You can see Jupiter and Saturn. The two, Jupiter is one of the brightest objects in the sky, but they're very, very close. Tonight they're even closer. Here's a photograph that somebody took last week from Italy, um, just showing a, through a telescope, showing Jupiter and Saturn very close in the sky. Here's a, uh, an animation that an engineer from NASA who I follow on Twitter has posted just showing what's going on. Now, this moon in this picture is not where it is. Uh, the moon is just posted here to show the scale, the size, to show how far apart these two objects are. And Jupiter and Saturn are both moving from right to left across the sky. Jupiter, because it's closer to the sun, is moving a bit faster, so it catches up and will pass Saturn. But at the instant tonight is where they're the closest together as possible in the sky. And this is the event that everybody is super excited about. To show why this happens, let me take you outside our solar system for a little bit. So if we step on a spaceship way out in our solar system and take a look down, you can see the orbits of all the planets around the sun. Um, if I zoom in just a little bit and try to reorient ourselves and get closer and watch what's going on, I'm going to back up about a year to the beginning of the year and we'll watch the Earth and the planets revolve around the sun. So the Earth is going around the sun. We're at April right now of 2020. Jupiter and Saturn are slowly moving from right to left around in a counterclockwise direction. As we approach August, get into September, the Earth is going to show up. We'll get closer to December and I'll try to stop it right at December 21st. To show where things are from the perspective. Oops, look, I missed. Let me back up a couple days. December 21st, and let me reorient things so that we can see the view from Earth looking towards Jupiter. Jupiter and Saturn just happen to be in their orbits at the place where it looks like they're exactly almost touching, even though they're millions of miles apart from each other. Um, that's why we see this super constellation. Again, it's been in the media for several weeks now that this is the Christmas star. And I wanted to do something a little different with that tonight. 
um, one of my side hobbies for about the last 20 years has been to research and look at the wise men and the star of Bethlehem. Uh, it's been something that I've been reading about, studying, playing with, thinking about for about 20 years. I have a collection of about 60 or 65 books on subjects from astronomy to ancient history to Roman and Jewish history to um, all kinds of options with what the star could have been, different models, different theories. I've got a pile of about 250 papers from astronomical journals and history journals trying to discover who are the wise men. And I've been pouring through this stuff because it's, it's, a, it's a, for me, a fascinating mystery problem. Trying to figure out who they were, what was it, figure out what are the possible options is the one that answers all the questions and satisfies what happens in scripture the best. So what I'm going to try to do tonight is to lay out what I think at least the most plausible explanation of what the wise men and the star could have been. Um, I've done this presentation multiple times. Um, this is the, the most recent revision. I've added some new material to try and go through. But when we talk about the wise men and the star, there's a couple things that you always tend to talk about, at least when we do the Sunday school or the Christmas stories or watch the TVs or look at your Christmas cards or pictures. We tend to get the story of these wise men, these three kings, riding on camels, following some magical, mystical light as it guides them across the desert. They're traveling across, trying to find this light as it moves through the sky, leading them on. And eventually, this bright light arrives over Bethlehem in this big, shining burst of light like a spotlight from the sky shines down illuminates the stable and the three kings come in join the shepherds at the birth of Jesus that night in the stable and they give their gifts and everybody's happy and if I was to quote Luke Skywalker everything I just said is completely wrong unfortunately or maybe fortunately because it makes it really interesting to play with the stuff that we usually attribute to in tradition to the story of the wise men being kings, riding camels, this big shining star in the sky, there's very little evidence that any of that actually happened. So what I want to do is try to unpack what could the star have been? Who were the magi? What was it all about? So here I'm going to tackle some questions. Questions that are pretty typical questions we would ask about a project or a problem. Who? I'm going to ask, who were the wise men? Where'd they come from? What's a wise man? What's a magi? Who were they? Why would they have been interested in looking at stars? When? When did they show up to worship the baby Jesus? Did they show up at the stable? Did they show up the same time as the shepherds or later? Along that point, we'll try to tackle a question of when was Jesus born, which is actually a more problematic question to answer than you might think. We'll take a look at where. Where in the sky would wise men, magi, have been looking for a star? And then what was the star? I'll try to give you my best after looking at all the possibilities and looking at the things and that happened and the answers that, that they give to the questions that we have to ask. What do I think the star would have been 2,020-some years ago that would have celebrated the first Christmas, the very first Christmas? So let's tackle the problem of who. One of my favorite songs at Christmas time is We Three Kings of Orient Are. Why do we call the wise men kings? That's because of tradition. There is nothing in scripture that says that the three wise men who showed up at the, at the, in the Matthew's account um, of the wise men showing up that they were kings. But as historians and church fathers, the church writers and the people who were writing books and leading the church in the early 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th centuries started to start celebrating Christmas. Um, I'll show you a little bit later on that, that people didn't actually start celebrating Christmas until about 400 years after Jesus was born. Christmas, the birth of Christ, was not nearly as important as his death and resurrection. It's only about 350 to 400 years after the birth that people actually started celebrating Christmas. First 400 years, nobody cared about when Jesus was born. It was when he died and rose again that mattered. But if, as people started to think about and read the gospel and think about this account of the wise men, the magi, the star, they started to do what often happens in tradition. You start to embellish things. If Jesus was this savior, if he was the king, the most important person, our savior, the, the most important person around whom the world revolves, then the people who showed up at his birth must have been important. They couldn't just be a bunch of people. They had to be important people. So we elevated them to kings. Tertullian, one of the first church historians, believes that they were kings from Arabia. 
there's a, a, an infancy gospel, an extra writing that fills in the stories of what happened between Jesus' birth and when he shows up in the temple at age 12 and then when he shows up again at age 30 to start his ministry. Since the Bible doesn't tell us that information, there were people who decided we need to fill in the gaps. And so one of those books that tries to fill in the missing pieces that we don't know, called the Armenian Inf Infancy Gospel, gives the king's names. And these are the names that through tradition have come down to stick with us. Melchior, Gaspar, and Balthazar. And over time, these kings started to be associated with location. So Melchior was identified as being the king of Persia. Usually identified as an old white guy, full beard. He's an old, represents the old age person. And sometimes in tradition, we assume that he is the descendant of Shem from Noah. Gaspar is the king of India, younger, ruddy complexion, the descendant of Ham. Balthazar, king of Ethiopia, middle-aged black. These names have no scriptural background. The kings, Persia, India, Ethiopia, there's nothing in history that says this where they come from. But these are the traditions that started to build up. And what's interesting is this category of old, middle-aged, and young, and white, some other complexion, and black, the skin colors and the ages of these people are trying to represent all possible groups of men. The idea was that these wise men, these kings, represent all of humanity coming to worship the baby that first Christmas. It starts to show up in art. So this is a mosaic in a very famous church in northern Italy um, showing the, the three kings dressed up in Persian garb with the names Balthazar, Melchior, and Gaspar at the top of the screen. Um, this church, interesting enough, uh, was spared a, a uh, being burned to the ground when the Persians attacked about 600 A.D. Um, because the Persians came in and saw this mosaic on the wall and recognized that the people were dressed in garb that looked like what they dressed, the clothes that they dressed in. So they left this church alone um, rather than burning it to the ground as they were doing to all the other buildings in the area. But this pervades art. So if I back up again, there's, there's uh, the guy in the middle is the young one. The guy in the right is the old guy. The guy on the left is the middle-aged. Other art, young, middle-aged, old, white, some kind of a more ruddy complexion, and black. My favorite Christmas story, The Little Drummer Boy, has a young black man, an older white man, and a middle-aged Chinese oriental um, king. Movies, modern movies, have the same thing. Three ages of people, three different skin colors. Lego, you buy toys. Lego and Playmobil even have... Um, the same thing, the same idea of young, middle-aged, old, different skin colors, this thing pervades across. This tradition has made it into almost every part of our society. Why do we show them riding camels? Here's another question. Three, three kings of Orion are, why are they riding camels in most of our nativity scenes in our pictures? Well, most likely, as far as I've been able to figure out, this comes from an interpretation of a couple passages out of the book of Isaiah in the Bible. Isaiah chapter 60 is talking about the Messiah, the future Messiah, and it talks about, it mentions this phrase, that nations will come to your light, oh, that must be the star in the sky, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Star in the sky, some kind of a light, must be kings. Wise men have to be kings. A multitude of camels will cover you, dromedaries from Midian, and they will bring gold and frankincense. And if you know your Christmas story, gold and frankincense are two of the three gifts that the wise men brought. So obviously, they must be kings riding camels, bringing gold and frankincense. Why three? Well, because there's three gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So there must have been three kings to bring those gifts with them. However, when we look back in history, we find that there are other variations on it. For example, there are some places where you can find three. So this is at Priscilla Catacombs. The catacombs in Rome were extravagant underground burial facilities where the early church would hide and meet in times of persecution. And as a result, when the church would meet down here, they used to paint pictures of biblical stories all over the walls. I'm going to come back to this catacombs in a little while with a really cool picture later on. But here at the top of this archway is a picture showing three kings, one, two, three, approaching a woman holding a child sitting in a chair. There are other variations of this three kings. Here's another one from another Roman catacombs in a different part of Rome. The woman holding the baby in the chair, three kings bearing gifts, three Persian-looking people bearing gifts, and some guy standing over the mother's shoulder pointing at a starry-looking object in the sky. So there are historical references that suggest there were three. But there are historical references that only show two. So there's another Roman catacombs that only shows two magi. There's another catacombs a little bit earlier that shows one, two on the left, and three, four on the right. Four magi, four wise men. 
There's a vase in the Kircher Museum in, in, in uh, Germany, in uh, Europe, that shows eight kings. There is a list from the medieval time period that lists the names of 12 kings that showed up. And John Chrysostom, who was a very important bishop in the late 300s to 400s, he was the first bishop, the first pastor who preached a sermon mentioning Jesus being born on the 25th of December. The very first time that the 25th of December was associated with the birth of Christ came in a sermon that John Chrysostom preached in about 380 AD, about 350 years after Jesus' death, about 380 years after his birth, the first time that Christmas is mentioned in a sermon, the birth of Christ. But in his sermon, he mentioned 14 kings and gives their names from some apocryphal book of Seth that he had found. There's a new book that just, um, I'm looking at my shelf, there's a new book that just came out a few years ago. It claims to have been written in, in 750 and it was apparently hidden in the Vatican Library for a number of years. Uh, it was just discovered as somebody was going through the archives and they translated it. It's a really, really weird book. Uh, it claims that the Magi, the, the wise men were descendants, Chinese descendants of Seth. There's about anywhere from 12 to 40 of them, depending on how you interpret some of the words. More importantly, it describes the star as being the actual physical Christ child floating around and flying through the air, talking to the wise men and then leading them. And then when they got to Bethlehem, the Christ child star in the sky flew down and then landed in the manger and talked to them from the manger. That's kind of a little bit really strange. But the point I'm trying to make is that 2, 4, 3, 12, 8, 20, 40... There's all kinds of varieties. So what does the Bible say? If I go to Matthew chapter 2, where the Bible actually talks about what we see, the Bible says, When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. You know what the Bible tells us? Not a whole lot. It tells us there's more than one. It tells us they're not kings. It doesn't make any mention of camels. And all it tells us is that they are from the east. So, Tradition has given us all kinds of filling in the details, but the Bible only tells us that they're wise men, more than one, doesn't say how many more, it doesn't say they're kings, and it tells us they come from somewhere east. So what's a wise man? Let me answer that question. In English, a lot of English translations use magi. Some English translations of the Bible, the Bible was not written in English, it was written in at least the New Testament was written in a variation on Greek, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and the Greek manuscripts from which Matthew has been translated into English, the Greek manuscripts used the word magi. There came magi in Greek from the east of Jerusalem. Magi is plural. Again, that just tells us there's more than one. Magus is the singular. Magi is plural. There's more than one magi. Whatever a magi is, they came to the Greek. The Greek word is magi. The Hebrew equivalent word that is often translated into magi when you translate Hebrew to Greek or when you go from Greek to Hebrew, the word in Hebrew means astrologers. That has a really bad connotation today because we think of astrologers now as being the people who write the horoscopes and you're gonna, you know, born out of the seventh sign, you're gonna have something happen to you, you read the newspaper, you know, it tells you whether you should buy a new car, or fall in love. That has nothing to do with what astrology was back in the time period of, you know, 3,000 years ago, 2,000, 2,500, 3,000 years ago. Astrologers back then were more like astronomers today. In fact, at that time period, science and religion were not divorced from each other like they are today. It's, it's really unfortunate today that scientists really don't want anything to do with religion and most religious people don't want anything to do with science. We have separated these two things, two ways of searching for truth. Back in the days, 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, the magi, these astrologers, were people who studied the stars and tried to interpret God's word, God's movement in history from that. I'll tell you more about that in just a sec. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel is the most famous magi in the Old Testament. And in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had this crazy dream. And he's going nuts with this dream because he can't figure out what this dream is. I'm sorry, I'm getting a phone call that I'm going to turn off. There we go. Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and it freaks him out and he wakes up and he can't remember the dream. He just knows it was a really scary dream. And so he calls together a whole bunch of advisors to tell him what was the dream and what did it mean. The people he calls together in Daniel chapter 2 in the Greek Septuagint are four groups of people, enchanters, magi, 
administrators of potions and Chaldeans. In our English tr translation, um, we usually translate these as magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, and Chaldeans. Chaldeans are just some kind of a, uh, the, 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 the scholarly people in, in Babylon. The Hebrew word that's translated magi is astrologers. So there were four groups of people that King Nebuchadnezzar asked to come and help him figure out his dream that scared him. One of those four grisly people was the Magi. But in verse 12 of Daniel chapter 2, those four categories are grouped together as wise men, both in Hebrew, in the Hebrew Old Testament, and in the Greek Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. These four categories of advisors are grouped together as wise men. So Magi were simply a subset, a subcategory of this overall group of wise men, and they specialized in astronomy and astrology. These were the scientists of their day who watched the motion, plotted out, wrote down, and watched ex exactly what the stars and the planets were doing in the night sky, but they didn't just observe, they tried to interpret. They interpreted dreams, they interpreted the motions of the planets and the stars and the heavens, comets, whatever they saw, and they tried to interpret it. And in, in their interpretation, they were trying to apply theology to history, to politics. They were trying to see what they saw in the science, their observations of the natural world, and they were trying to use that, what they saw, to help explain the world around them, past, present, and future events. That's what a Magi is. So, when Jesus was born at Bethlehem, there came Magi, people who were aware of the stars, watched what was going in the heavens, and used what they saw to interpret the birth of kings, the death of kings, the rise of a new empire, all kinds of information like that that they were trying to find. They came to Jerusalem from the east. This phrase in Greek I can't pronounce Greek. I use Greek letters and all the math and the work that I do in, uh, let's see, I'm getting, I hope you guys can still see. I've got something weird on my screen. Can somebody just text in and let me know that you can still see what's going on or hear me? Because one of my screens just froze. And I'm hoping this is still coming through. Somebody just type in the text if you can see something. I am not seeing anything in my window at all. Let me just ask my wife if she can still hear. You can. You can see it. Okay, you can see everything. Okay, so my one of my the screen I'm looking at for getting all my answers and questions is completely frozen, so I can't, unfortunately, see a thing that's going on. All right. Too many screens and computers, and I can't even open up the questions. All right, I apologize for that. I will try to look at the questions and answers in a few minutes. I cannot access them at the moment because I can't. All right, All right. so let me keep going. This phrase, from the east, uh, means, it's, it, it's, if I try to pronounce it, I guess, apo anatalon. Uh, my screen just died. Oh, hang on. Okay. Let's try that again. Share screen. Go back to the presentation. All right. Okay. I will try to keep track of what's going on elsewhere. Sorry about that. Little technology glitch. Exciting world we live in. All right. Magi from the east. This phrase, from the east in Greek, literally means from the risings or from the east, and all it does is refer to a geographical direction. Literally what it means is... The Magi, these astrologers, these people who studied the sky, studied the stars, they simply came from a location that was east of Jerusalem. So we could ask the question, what countries east of Judea had wise men who were Magi, astrologers, at the time of Christ's birth? And if we go looking through history, they started out in Assyria. Assyria got conquered by Babylon. Babylon got conquered by Media. The Medes got conquered by the Persians. At the time of Christ... Those groups of areas were gathered into what's called the Parthian Empire. The Parthian Empire, at the time of Christ, was the arch enemy of Rome. So here's a map that shows the Roman Empire. This big red line around the entire edge is the Roman, the limits of the Roman Empire. Rome and Italy in the middle, the little tiny kingdom of Herod and Judea over here on the right. And the Parthian Empire extends all the way what would today be Iraq and Iran, and even some part of Afghanistan. That huge part in the east. Uh, here's another map that shows just a little bit bigger, bigger picture. The, the kind of brownish color is the Roman Empire. The green is the Parthian Empire. This 
gray area that has nothing in the middle is the desert in Arabia. This little place near Gaza is where Jerusalem is not too far away from there. At this time period, we, we hear lots and lots about Romans, the Roman Empire, because in our Western culture, that's the culture, the, the, the society, the outgrowth of where we in Europe to America came a lot of us from the Roman Empire beginnings. But the Parthians were the, uh, the, the only kid on the block at that point in time that could challenge Rome during this time period. The Parthians were exceptionally well known for their cavalry, their horsemen. They went to battle with two groups of, of soldiers on horses, ho guys on horses wearing uh, like a scaled armor with lances, very long sharp spears, and more importantly, people on horses, bowmen on horses with bows and arrows. They were deadly accurate with their bows, a very short bow, very powerful bow that could fling arrows very fast, very hard, but more, more accurately or more, more importantly, they could sh shoot their bows and arrows while riding and they would turn around backwards. So they could ride frontwards and they would turn around backwards and shoot with deadly accuracy behind them. What, what they would do is they would go into battle and they would attack and then they would pretend to retreat. And so they would pretend to retreat, ride their horses away from the attacking army. And while they were riding away, they would turn around and shoot with deadly accuracy behind them and just decimate the, ro the soldiers that were trying to follow them. In fact, I have this phrase up here called the Parthian shot. In our English language today, we might, you might use a phrase called the parting shot. If you're having an argument with someone and you're the last person to get in the last dig, the last insult, you got the parting shot. That phrase, the origin of that phrase is actually the Parthian shot. This idea of letting loose an arrow with deadly accuracy and killing your enemy as you are riding away from him. That will come up important in a moment when we look at how the Parthians and the Romans fought. But it is most likely that Magi coming from Parthia would have ridden horses, not camels. Because the Parthians were expert horsemen, and if they arrived, the wise men arrived, the Magi from Parthia arrived, they would have been accompanied by a number of armed guards, horsemen, riding horses. All right, a lot of the Magi, not all, but a lot of the Magi followed a religion called Zoroastrianism. After a guy named Zoroaster, otherwise known as Zarathustra, thus spake Zarathustra, is a famous phrase, poem, song. This religion of, of Zoroastrianism has a lot of similarities to Christianity and, and some aspects of, of Islam as well. This religion predicted the future arrival of three saviors, the third of which, the last one would defeat evil, die and be resurrected from the dead, and announce the coming of God's kingdom on earth. So if there were magi who were looking for a savior, who would die and come back to life again and bring God's kingdom to earth, if they were not only with following Zoroastrianism, but if they had been influenced by Daniel. Daniel was... I'm sorry, my screen is doing something crazy again. Sorry about that. All right. Daniel was during the reigns of King Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar and Darius the Mede, Daniel was the greatest of all the wise men in that time period. He was the greatest one. He, in fact, he, and Nebuchadnezzar and Darius both made him the prefect, made him the ruler of all the other wise men. So he was in charge of all the magi. Daniel also knew the scriptures. We know this from seeing the things that Daniel wrote and said. And I believe that Daniel knew, we're going to talk about this prophecy out of Numbers 24. I believe that Daniel was well-versed with the prophecy out of Numbers that talked about a star coming forth from Jacob. And if Daniel had an influence in teaching some of the Magi the traditions and the prophecies of the Jewish scriptures, the Israelite scriptures, some of these Magi would have known that the Jewish scriptures predicted a Messiah who would come forth from Jacob and that there would be a star that would be announcing his presence. We also know that the Magi from Parthia would have noticed what was going on in the sky because we have records from Babylon. These are really boring tablets to read. If you could read Babylonian, I can't. But if you could read them, uh, these, these tablets are basically just pointing out the positions of the planets. So the, the tablet on the upper left is showing the positions of Jupiter and Saturn in 7 and 6 BC, where they are every single night of the year. 
so it'd be like they're going out trying to watch the great conjunction of 2020 and all they're doing is just writing down how far apart they are where they are in the sky what it looks like oh tonight was cloudy and they're just going on to finishing those details the part the table on the right shows that they were aware of the of the position of venus from the year 3 to 2 bc every night they simply wrote down where it was how bright it was what it looked like whether there were clouds or not where they could see it so we know that they were tracking these things further evidence that parthians that Parthia is where the Magi possibly came from, is that when Herod, it, it, Herod's reaction, so when the Magi show up to Jerusalem, here's the, the continuing passage in Matthew chapter 2, when Jesus was born, Magi from the east come to Jerusalem and say, where is he who was born king of the Jews? We've seen his star and we've come to worship him. And the next verse says, when Herod the king heard these things, when he heard that there were Magi from the east, from Parthia, looking for a newborn king, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. That means that Herod was exceptionally concerned and worried about Parthians. Now, before I can tell you exactly why he was worried, I got to fix one other word here. In, in almost all of, our, all of our English translations, this word is king of the Jews. The Greek word, if you look at the Greek New Testament, the Greek word is Judeans. And for some reason, ever since the time of Martin Luther and on from the Reformation, this word has always been translated Jews. It is never translated as Judeans, but the word Judeans has much more political meaning than just simply Jews, which involves all of the people of Israel. The Judeans were the people who lived in Judea, the remnant of the tribe of Judah, surrounding Jerusalem in the southern part of the kingdom of Israel. The Judeans were the ones who, after the captivity in Babylon, when they came back to their homeland, back to Judah, the Judeans were the ones who preserved the knowledge of God's word. They were the ones who preserved the worship, preserved the sacrifices, rebuilt the temple. They were the ones who orchestrated the worship of God. They were the ones from whom the Pharisees and the Sadducees came, the scribes and the chief priests, the ones who laid down the law and interpreted the law and made sure that the people of God followed the law. Very, very different from the other Jewish people who lived in the north especially those half-tribe, half-breeds from Samaria who were mingled in and mixed with people who weren't even Israel at all. And then way up north, you got these hicks from Galilee, these Jews that really are kind of like backwoods, hillbillies up there. This word Judeans in the end of the Gospels when Jesus is hung on a cross and Pilate makes a sign that gets hung above the cross and the sign that Pilate writes says, here is Jesus of Nazareth, king of the, our translations always say king of the Jews. In Greek, it says, here is Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Judeans. And we read that the chief priests and the Pharisees were livid, angry at, at Pilate and said, you cannot say that. You cannot say he is not the king of the Jews. You could say he said he was the king of the Judeans, but how dare you say that Jesus of Nazareth is king of the Judeans because they believe that nothing good comes from Nazareth. There is no way ever that a person from Judea would accept a king from Galilee, from Nazareth. There's a political fight, and you can read in the, in the end of the Gospels that Pilate knew exactly what he was doing. Because it says that Pilate recognized that the Pharisees and the chief priests were jealous of what Jesus had. And he said, no, what I've written, I've written. It was Pilate's way of like getting in the last dig, getting in his Parthian shot. He was forced to... to to um, crucify Jesus, even though he declared him to be innocent, but he puts the sign King of the Judeans. This is important now in, in Herod's day because Herod is the king of Judea, but he has no right to be. And we have Parthians who show up and say, where is the king of the Judeans? Let me do a little bit of history. Join the map again. Parthia on the right Rome, Roman Empire on the left, the kingdom of Judea is stuck right in the middle. Right about the time when Jesus was born, there was a brand new king, King Phratis III in Parthia. When new kings come to power, they often try to flex their muscles a little bit and stretch their territory and try to see how strong the borders are. Often wars start, at least in the ancient world, when a new king comes to power and tries to assert his dominance over his own people and the people nearby. So there was concern at the end of Herod's reign, at the time when Jesus was born, that a new king in Parthia, and now I've got Parthians, plus there's a little bit more history. This is kind of fun. At least I think it's kind of fun. In 63 BC, the Roman Empire 
the Roman army under the the, con the command of General Pompey captures Jerusalem. Up until this point, for the last 110, 120 years or so, Judea, especially the, the, the part of Judea, Galilee, the whole region had been self-autonomous. They were a standalone country. After the Babylonian Empire, the Babylonians were conquered by the Greeks. The Greeks then split up in a whole bunch of differences, a whole bunch of 400 years of history when the period, the area of Israel was conquered and ruled by other people, but they gained their independence and for about 110, 120 years, they were independent until 63 BC when the Roman army under Pompey captured Jerusalem and Judea now becomes a Roman territory. Parthia is growing. Romans and the Parthians are starting to battle against each other. In 53 BC, the Roman Emperor Crassus tries to take on the Parthians and see if he can invade their territory. And this is shortly after he had just raided the temple in Jerusalem. So the Jews, the Judeans, are exceedingly angry at the Romans for having desecrated the temple, raiding the temple. The Romans had invaded. They were the overlords. They wanted them gone. Parthians went to war against the Romans. The Romans invaded, and the Romans thought they were going to have an easy victory. The Romans under Crassus took 40,000 crack Roman troops into battle. The Parthians had 10,000 horsemen, 1,000 horsemen with, with lances and 9,000 horsemen with arch, or 9, horses with bows, the, the archers. 40,000 versus 10,000, it's a 4 to 1 odds. That seems pretty good odds. The Romans got a pretty good chance of winning this one. The Parthians employed their Parthian shot. They would run towards, ride towards the enemy, towards the Romans, and then pretend to retreat and ride away. The Romans would give chase. The Parthians would turn around and shoot over their shoulders, and they just decimated the Roman army. 20,000 Romans were killed. Another 10,000 Romans were captured. Another 10,000 were wounded. This was the worst defeat that the Roman army had suffered up to this point. It is the only time in Roman, the history of the Roman Empire, when their standard, like the, the flag, carrying the flag into battle, it is the only time that the Roman standard was captured by the enemy. This was a terrible defeat of the Roman army, and the ones who defeated the Roman army were the Parthians. The Parthians in 40 BC, about 13 years later, chased the Romans out of Judea, and they gave Judea back to the Jewish people. The Parthians were the heroes, the rescuers, the saviors of the area of Judea. They chased the Romans out. They restored the Hasmonean royal line. King Antigonus was now the king for three years. They enjoyed an autonomy again. The kingdom of Israel had been restored, and it was restored by the Parthians. Well, at the same time period in 40 BC, Herod runs away to Rome. And in Rome, Mark Antony and um, Octavian were three of a triumvirate. Uh, Ptolemy was the third one, I believe. Um, Mark Antony, and, and this is the time period of Mark Antony and Cleopatra. If you know your Egyptian and Shakespeare history, Mark, Mark Antony and Cleopatra are in this time frame. The same thing that's going in. Um, so in 40 BC, Herod goes back to Rome. He runs away to Rome, and he manages to talk Mark Antony and Octavian and the Roman Senate into appointing him to be the king of Judea, in order to act as a buffer between the Roman Empire and the Parthians. They're, they're going to give him a small army. Herod's going to go back to Judea. Herod is going to be the king of Judea, if he can take it back from the Parthians, and act as a buffer. This is a problem because it's not as easy as it might look. It takes Herod three years of fighting. He, he lays siege to Jerusalem for a three-year time period. Finally, after three years of siege walls and trying to starve the people out, he captures Jerusalem, he kills Antigonus, and he becomes the king by appointment of Rome. The problem is that Herod is not Jewish. He, he's not even half Jewish. He, Herod is half Idumean. Idumeans were descended from the, the Edomites from Esau. Jacob's brother, Jacob, Israel, the tribe of the Israelites. Herod is from the Edomites, Esau, Jacob's brother. These are people that the people of Israel were told to avoid. They were the enemy, in a sense. His mother was an Arabian, so he is not at all Jewish, and yet he is now the king of Judea, not because he had any right to be, but because he was appointed king by the Romans who took Rome, took Jerusalem, took Judea back from the Parthian freedom. So, Herod's the king. A new king in Parthia has come to the throne. Herod's 
king by appointment only. He's very much hated by the people of Judea. And into Jerusalem ride a contingent of Parthians, magi who make kings, who proclaim who in the Parthian Empire would be king. They arrive with a huge contingent of horsemen, bows, terrifying the people who come in. The Parthians show up, the arch enemy of Rome, the people that King Herod is most afraid of, and they ask, where is he who has been born king of the Judeans? They know that Herod is not king because he was born to be king. He was king because he was appointed king. And so the Parthians arrive and say, where is the rightful, truly born king of the Judeans? The Parthians were the ones who had saved Judah before. You can understand why Herod was troubled and why all of Jerusalem might be in an uproar when they comes in and this happens. All right. Wise men, magi from Parthia. When did they arrive? Go back to scriptures. We can see that Jesus was born in Jerusalem from the days of Herod the king. Wise men, magi from the east saying, where is he that is born? In, in this specific English translation, it doesn't do the past tense very well. If we go to the Greek language, it makes it very clear that this is past tense. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, the Magi came saying, where is he who has been born? By the time the Magi show up in Jerusalem, Jesus has been born some time already. In fact, a few verses later, we're told that the Magi come to the house, not a stable, the house, and they saw the young child, not a baby. In fact, the word for young child here in the Greek language is a word that means a toddler, anywhere from 18 months to, to two years. This is not a newborn baby that the Magi come to see. This is a toddler, a year and a half to two years old, and he's in a house when they come and find him. Which means that, unfortunately, most of our um, nativity scenes are completely wrong. Um, this nativity scene is a very popular one. It has the wise men and the star showing up at the stable with the manger at the same time that the shepherd and the angel. It all happens in one night. Everything's all together. There's, uh, there's so many things that are wrong about it. I mean, it's, it's a pretty picture, but I'm afraid that there are so many things that are wrong biblically and historically. Um, I'm, I'm talking about the star and the wise men tonight, so I'm going to try really hard not to talk about the fact, I'm talking about it anyway, that, that even though tradition says Jesus was born in a stable, there is absolutely nothing in Scripture that says he was born in a stable. It says that, that Jesus was placed in a manger because there was no room for him in the and if you fill in the blank, you all know that the English translation says there is no room at the inn. That is a terrible translation of a word that the only two times that word is used elsewhere in Scripture, in the Gospel of Mark and later on in the Gospel of Luke, it is used correctly, translated correctly, to be the guest room or the upper room in Jerusalem where Jesus celebrates his Passover with his disciples. There's all kinds of historical evidence, cultural evidence, archaeological evidence that in the time period when Jesus was born... Houses in a small village like Bethlehem had two areas, an upper room area where the people lived and a lower area where the animals inside the house, the animals were kept, donkeys, cattle, sheep, goats, they were kept inside the house at night, partly for warmth, partly to keep them safe. And I'll, I'll show you some reasons why in a minute. When, G, when Joseph and Mary came to Bethlehem, they would not have stayed at a hotel because there was no hotel. There was no such lodging place in Bethlehem at that point in time, they would have gone to a house with family. And I'll tell you more about the family in just a minute. They would have been in a house and it says that Mary placed Jesus in a manger because there was no room in the guest room. The guest room was already full of people who were there for the same reason that Joseph and Mary were there to put their names on a census on an enrollment. So there's no stable, but I'm talking about the wise men. Let me get back to the topic of what I want to talk about. I just find this stuff so fascinating. It's all right. All right, the wise men shouldn't be here. The wise men come to a house after Jesus is born. Um, since I started doing these presentations several years ago, my wife has started changing our nativity scene. So here's the nativity scene in our house. Um, on the mantle in our fireplace, uh, she collects little mice, charming tails, mice figurines. So our stable, our nativity scene in the middle, it does have a stable. We haven't gotten away from that yet. But our nativity scene has the, the, the mice, Joseph and Mary, and the baby and the shepherds and the animals all around. But our wise men are correctly on uh, the other side of the nativity place on the mantle. Our wise men are like way far away. They're still walking around trying to find out where everything is because they haven't arrived at 
the birth. They aren't there when the shepherds and the angels show up. They come much later when Jesus is a child. So we've, we've corrected our, my wife has corrected our nativity scene to put the wise men where they belong across the room. Um, every once in a while, she'll do this without me noticing. She'll start moving them closer. So as they get, you know, as they, we get closer to January, they'll start moving closer and closer and closer to the nativity scene um, in there. We can ask a more general question. What year was Jesus born? And this is a question that actually I find amazing. You can argue that Jesus Christ is the most important person in all of Western history, in all of world history. Our calendar is built around the year that we think he was born. But if you want to go actually to factual evidence, we do not know with any kind of certainty, not only the day or the month, we celebrate on December 25th. There is no historical uh, information at all that shows that's a valid date. It, it, the first time that December 25th was celebrated as Christmas was four, 350 to 400 years after the birth of Christ. More importantly, we don't know with any kind of certainty what year Jesus was born. When you start looking through all the historical documents, all the references, all the historians, both modern and, and, and ancient, who start looking at it, we find a huge disparity. So this is a, a chart. I'm a scientist. I draw charts and stuff to plot data. It shows two groups of people, modern historians, people from the last hundred years who've been researching this topic. And, and, and fortunately in history, there's sometimes some chronological snobbery that we think we know much more than people in the ancient days do because we're just smarter and we have a lot more resources than them. Even though the ancient people might have had access to documents that we don't have anymore because libraries burned down and volcanoes erupted and earthquakes happened. Anyway, Modern historians, most modern sources would say that Jesus was born sometime between 7 BC and 5 BC. Most historians put his birth at 6 BC. Interesting enough, the, you know, nowadays we, we use CE, Common Era, and before the Common Era, we don't like to refer to Christ in our you know, secular world. Before Christ, AD, this map shows us that Jesus was born before Christ, which means that our calendar is wrong. Okay, Modern historians say that Jesus was born about 6 BC. Ancient historians would say that Jesus was born about 3 BC. I tend to go with the time window that ancient historians for a number of reasons. Partly because I trust the ancient historians knew something that we don't. Plus, there is a, a reason for Joseph and Mary to have gone to Bethlehem that happens in 3 BC that does not happen in 6 BC. And there was something in the sky that happens that would have explained why the Magi would have gone to see a baby in Jerusalem, in Bethlehem, that happens in 3 BC, much better than a couple of theories that show up earlier. Okay, so let's see. Why, why is this the year 2020? It's been a terrible year. COVID, elections, unrest, protests. It's, you know, most of us are getting ready to turn the corner to 2020. But why is this the year 2020? Our modern calendar was set up but the year 527 by a monk by the name of Dionysius, uh, otherwise known as Dennis the Little. And he was tasked by the Pope of the day to calculate the date of Easter. Easter is one of those weird holidays. Christmas always falls on December 25th. Okay? Thanksgiving always falls on the fourth Thursday of November in the U.S. July 4th always falls on, well, July 4th. Easter is the first Sunday after the first full moon following the spring equinox, which usually happens on March 21st. So you gotta know when the spring equinox is, then you look for the first full moon, and then you calculate the first Sunday after the first full moon. That's why Easter some years is in March, and some years at the end of April. There's a, almost a six week variation on when Easter falls, and it changes every single year because of the way we calculate Easter. Dionysius was charged with the task of, we, instead of trying to calculate this every single year, you just sit down and run the numbers and calculate out for the next 100 years so we can put it on a calendar and not have to worry about it. So he did. At that point in time, the calendar that was used in Western Europe was used as its reference point, the reign of the Roman Emperor Diocletian. Diocletian was an emperor who was one of the worst persecutors of the Christian church. And as Dionysius was rearranging the calendar, he said, why are we referencing a calendar to an evil, wicked king who opposes Christianity? Why don't we reference it to Jesus instead? So he reoriented the calendar to Jesus' birth. Now, if you've, if you've done any reading about this, you, you might know the story that, that it is claimed that Dionysius made a huge error and he's four years off on his calculation. And most people would say that it's because he forgot that the Emperor Augustus actually reigned for four years under the name of Octavian before he became Augustus. And so his calendar is off by four years. 
that would be like saying that a person who was writing a, a calendar in, in America in the United States would be uh, happened to forget that Grover Cleveland had two presidencies that were not contiguous, not back to back. He was president, then not president, and president again. Or remember that Zachary Taylor died after being president for 30 days. For Dionysius not to know the actual history of the Roman emperors is a little bit ridiculous. Most likely, and I've read this from looking at some documents that, that uh, the former um, astronomer curator at the Vatican, uh, looking at the actual letters and documents that Dionysius himself wrote, Dionysius re the calendar because he believed that Jesus died in the spring of AD 33. In fact, we don't know for sure if it was AD 33 or AD 30. It's amazing that we don't know the exact details of the most important person in history, when he was born, when he died. Most likely he died in 33 AD. There's a number of good reasons for that. I'm not going to get into that right now. Dionysius believed that since Jesus was perfect, he must have lived a perfect life length of life of 33 and one-third years, which if he was died in April of 33 AD, then you back up and that means he was born on December 25th. And so therefore he created a calendar and the new calendar began on January 1st, AD 1. And we are now 2020, 2020 years after that point in time. I will mention that the first ever reference to a church actually celebrating the birth of Christ, the Christ Mass, why that's why we call it Christmas, because of a church service, the Catholic Mass, in honor of the Christ's birth, the Christ Mass uh, being celebrated on, on December 25th occurs in 354 and 3, 386. 350 to 380 years after Jesus is born is the very first time that they actually celebrate Christmas, the birth of Christ on the 25th. Up until that point, they didn't do it at all. All right, what, is this, what does the Bible have to say about when Jesus is born? How does this fit into our time period? After Jesus is born in the days of Herod the king, we're told that Herod saw that he'd been tricked by the Magi later on. He ends up killing a bunch of babies under two years old according to the time that he had ascertained from the Magi. So if there is a two-year period and Herod is still alive when Jesus is born, what we can draw from this is that Jesus was born at least two years before King Herod dies. And Josephus, the only historian that tells us anything about Herod at all, tells us that Herod died after having reigned 37 years, and unfortunately, Josephus gives us no reference point to identify exactly when that was. He just tells us that Herod died after having reigned 37 years, and we have to extrapolate from Josephus' other references to try and figure out when that might have happened. We do know that Josephus tells us that Herod dies after an eclipse of the moon. Eclipse of the moon happens, and he dies before Passover. So sometime after the eclipse of the moon, before Passover, we can go back and astronomy, things like the moon and the earth and the sun, they are a, a clockwork mechanism. We can know exactly when all of the historical eclipses happened from any point on the earth's surface. We know that there was a total eclipse in September 5 BC, a partial kind of halfway eclipse in 4 BC, nothing in between, and then a total eclipse in January 1 BC. The picture I'm showing right here is the January 1 total, the January 1 BC eclipse. Modern historians tend to prefer the partial eclipse in 4 BC, and so they say Jesus was born in 6. But if we go with the ancient historians, the ancient writers, if and we use the 1 BC total eclipse that defines when Herod died, then that would put Jesus born at the time period when they all believe he died in, when Jesus was born in 3 BC. All right, there's another clue. If we can put the pinpoint. Luke's gospel, talking about the shepherds and the birth in Bethlehem, says that it came about those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census should be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census when Quirinius was governor of Syria. This is a problem because we know when almost all of the governors, the official Roman legates, the imperial legates, the governors of Syria were, our buddy Quirinius was governor about 10 years too late. The only governorship, the only time when Quirinius was governor of Syria is AD 6, which means either Luke is wrong, and we have a problem with that because Luke, in every other point when he makes a reference to a person in history, Luke is always dead on accurate. If Luke tells us something, we know that it's got to be right, so it means that we must be misunderstanding something about what he is saying. Ancient, the, the modern historians putting Jesus' birth at 6 BC would say that that Verus Quintilius Publius, those are fun, Roman names are fun to say. Publius Quintilius Verus was the governor during the time period when Jesus was born. The ancient historians say that Jesus was born in 3 BC and we have absolutely no idea. 
there's a period of about a 10-year period in Roman history that we've lost information, and we do not know with any kind of reliable source of information who the governor of Syria was from 4 to 1 BC. But we know that Quirinius was the governor later. There are two possibilities to fix this problem in Luke. One is that the phrase, while Quirinius was governor of Syria, could also be accurately translated from the Greek as when Quirinius was governing not in the position of the official governor, but with some kind of a military capacity. We do know that Quirinius was in Syria as a commander of the Roman legions, putting down a rebellion by a bunch of uprising, a bunch of tribes that were trying to revolt against Roman occupation in Syria during that time period. So he was governing in Syria during the 4 to 1 BC time period. It's also possible that that phrase, this was the first census, that means that Quirinius did too. We know that when Quirinius was governor in AD 6, um, that was when Judea became part of the province of Syria and annexed to Syria. And there was a census that you can read about in the book of Acts, chapter 4, I believe. The census is mentioned. It caused a huge uprising because there was a tax involved with it. That's the, the, the reference, the census that most people are aware of that Quirinius was involved with. It is entirely possible to write this passage in Luke and say this was a census before Quirinius was the governor of Syria. So we can get around this problem. There's a bigger question of what is the census. Most of the time, a lot of translations will say this was taxes. That's the most commonly used thing as we take a census so we can figure out how to tax people. Except that if it was a tax, it was a tax only on Roman citizens. Romans, the Romans never taxed non-citizens. They only taxed their citizens. And Mary and Joseph were not citizens of Rome. So they would never have had to go anywhere to pay your taxes. Plus, when you paid taxes in Rome, you never had to pay your taxes at your ancestral birthplace. You simply paid them wherever you were. The Greek word that's usually translated as taxes, though, actually means census, and it really means to be enrolled or to be registered. Now, here's what we know. Octavian, later known as Augustus Caesar, Octavian became emperor in 31 BC. He was given the honorary title of Augustus in 27 BC, four years later. On the 25th anniversary of his being Augustus, He was awarded a prize, the title of Father of Our Country, Pater Patriae. 25 years after 27 puts us in 2 BC. There are many historical documents that tell us that across the Roman Empire, every single person, not just Romans, but every single person in the Roman Empire in 3 BC had to go back to their home place their ancestral homes in order to enroll, to register their names on an oath of allegiance that was presented to Caesar Augustus as the 25th anniversary of his achieving the title of Augustus in which he was awarded the father of the country. I want to toss out a a, a word here. This was everybody across the entire empire. Usually when we think of Joseph and Mary going to Jerusalem, we think of them going all by themselves. Mary's riding a donkey, even though that's nowhere in scripture. It does not say at all that she rode a donkey. We're simply told that they went to Bethlehem because they had to enroll and put their names on the census. If this is the census, this worldwide, Roman Empire-wide, every single person in the Roman Empire had to sign their name to an oath of allegiance in honor of Augustus for the 25th anniversary of this title being given to him, not only would Joseph had to have gone to Bethlehem, but Joseph's brothers would have had to gone to Bethlehem. Joseph's father, his grandfather, his uncles, and his cousins, his male cousins, every single male relative in Joseph's family would have had to also go to Bethlehem to sign this registration, this oath of allegiance. Unless Joseph was the only descendant left and everybody else in his entire family had died, when they got to Bethlehem, there would have been a massive family reunion. That's why there was no room in the guest room and Jesus had to be put in a manger down where the animals were because the house was filled with Joseph's brothers and fathers and uncles and cousins. Now, we're not told about them because they don't matter to the story. It's Joseph and Mary and Jesus that matter, but this allows us to fit the time period. Okay. When Jesus was born this time period, the timing of when, of when we can solve almost all of the problems in this story if Herod dies, 
before the 1 BC lunar eclipse after having reigned as king of Judea for 37 years. The census conducted in 3 BC was the registration empire-wide for Caesar Augustus' 25th anniversary celebration that was awarded to him in 2 BC. And this census happened while Quirinius had military control in Syria, but before his actual governorship in AD 6. So that's the time period, 4 to 2 BC, focusing on 3. What happened within that time period? Okay, I'm looking at the time when I teach the classes on Zoom for this whole semester. I usually give my students a stretch break. So if you're at home, you've been sitting for almost an hour. If you want to stretch for just a moment to take a break, we've got a couple more questions to go. I'm not going to go for three more hours, though I could, but I'm not going to. I'll spare you that. We know who. The wise men, magi, astrologers, scientists, star watchers, theologians from Parthia arriving sometime in the 42 BC window when Herod is king. Joseph and Mary are going to Bethlehem to fill out this registration to satisfy a decree from Augustus Caesar. Where, now when I'm asking this question where, what I'm really asking is where in the sky would the Magi have looked for a star? Everybody is celebrating tonight's Jupiter Saturn conjunction, the great conjunction of 2020, the great winter conjunction, the Christmas star is what everybody in social media is announcing this thing is. But just because two stars, two planets are close together in the sky does not mean anything, especially to ancient people, to the ancient magi. It didn't matter what was happening in the sky. What mattered was where in the sky was it happening. So for Jupiter and Saturn to be really close is interesting. Maybe you know, they jotted down right on their clay tablets and they were you know, recording where Jupiter and Saturn were in the sky. But what was more important was what constellation did this conjunction happen in? Where in the sky? What time of day? Was it at rising? At the morning? Was it just after sunset? Was it in the middle? Where in the sky? And when? what time of day? Those were the things that mattered more than just what was it. So a conjunction is special, but a conjunction has to happen in the right constellation at the right time of year, at the right time of day, in order for it to be important. Let's see what the scriptures say. What does the Bible say about what the Magi saw? Going back to the book of Matthew. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, there came magi from the east, from Parthia, to Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Judeans? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. That phrase, we have seen his star in the east. I've got the word from the east in blue because that's a direction, a location. The phrase in the east is a Greek phrase that literally means at its rising or when it's rose. It's almost the same words, but it's slightly different. It means when the star rose. So a better translation would be, we have seen his star at its rising, or we saw his star as it rose. That's what they would be saying. All right, so let's try and figure out some more things. Herod, when he's trying to figure out where this new king would be born, because he's freaking out that the Parthians are here trying to take Judea away from him. Herod secretly calls the Magi and finds out from them the time the star appeared. He's trying to find out how old this baby is. The time the star appeared. This Greek word here is the word phenomenu. From, and it means to appear or to become visible. So this phrase, he was trying to find out from the Magi the time that the star had become to be visible. When did this star show up? Now, this brings to my mind this phrase from Numbers 24. The star shall come forth, appear from Jacob. A scepter shall rise, come forth, become visible from Israel. How does this fit in? To figure out where the star appeared and where it matters in the sky, i got to do just a little bit of astrological, astronomical geography for you. So this is what the sky looks like. There's the sun in the middle. There's the earth. And the picture is on the outside of the 12 major constellations that break down into the months. The scriptures tell us in the book of Genesis that, that God made the sun, the moon, and he also made the stars. And he put the stars there for the times and the seasons and the years. The stars were the ancient calendar. You want a calendar now, you pull out your phone and you, you flip and pull out the calendar app and you figure out what you, know, what you got going on your schedule tomorrow. Back in the ancient world, they went outside and they looked up in the stars and they saw what constellation is in the sky at night. Whatever constellation is in the sky at night, that let them know this is the month, this is the year, harvest is coming up, it's going to get cold soon. These constellations, now the way this picture works is the, the, the side of the earth, it's, whoops, sorry, where did that go? There it goes, sorry, 
lost the picture. The side of the, of the earth facing the sun is daytime. The side of the earth on the other side of the sun is nighttime. And the pictures on this big cylinder are showing us what you would see at midnight, what you would see at nighttime. So Aquarius in January, February. In March, you'd see Pisces at midnight. At March and April, you'd see Aries, Taurus. As If you go outside at midnight every night and, and go from month to month to month, as the earth revolves around the sun, the part of the sky that we see at night changes. And so it's a calendar, a map that's showing us what's going on in the night sky. There are four of these constellations that are really important for scripture and for this part of the star. Aquarius, which is usually drawn as a man holding buckets of water. Aquarius, the water bearer. Taurus, in April, May. Taurus is the bull. Leo, the lion, July and August. And Scorpio, Scorpio, which we know as a scorpion, but researchers who study ancient cultures have shown when they try to look up the origins of star names and the origins of constellations names, in the time period of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when Israel was beginning, the constellation we know as Scorpius to the ancient Israelites, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that constellation was an eagle carrying a snake. Not a scorpion, but an eagle carrying a snake. That's what the, what the constellation was interpreted by the ancient Hebrews in that time period. So Aquarius, the water bearer, Taurus, the bull, Leo, the lion, Scorpius, the eagle carrying a snake. Those are the four that matter. These four zodiac signs show up in scripture. There are some really weird descriptions in the book of Ezekiel and Revelation of cherubim, angelic beings that stand before the throne of God and constantly cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. These creatures have weird descriptions. Each creature has four faces or four sides. There's these weird wings with like six pairs of wings and they fly and they cover themselves. There's eyes all over the place. But the faces of these creatures are a man, an ox, a lion, and an eagle. Same as the four constellations, Aquarius, Taurus, Leo, and Scorpio. If Scorpio was an eagle carrying a snake. Historically, the symbols of the four gospels and the meanings. This is a, 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 an illustrated manuscript called the Book of Kells, a very famous um, calligraphy, autographed, drawn uh, copy of the, the, the four gospels written in about 600 AD in uh, Ireland and Northern Scotland. Matthew is portrayed as a man, the king. Mark portrays Jesus as a lion, the, 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 the brave one who does all the action. Luke portrays Jesus as a bull, an ox, or a calf, the man, the servant who is sacrificed for his people. And John portrays Jesus as, he's given the reference as an eagle, since Jesus is the word of God, the knowledge, the, the son of God. Man, lion, bull, and eagle, those four images show up in history and scripture. They also show up in the book of Numbers, and this is where we're going to get to that announcement of a, of a, a star. In Numbers chapter 2, describes the camps of Israel. They're, they've left Egypt. They've crossed the Red Sea. They're about to, they, they broke the rules and were denied access into the promised land, so they're going to wander around the desert for 40 years. And God gives them rules for how they are supposed to march through the desert and how they're supposed to organize themselves by camps. And Numbers chapter 2 gives instructions for camp by camp by camp. They camp by tribes and they camp under banners or standards or flags. Judah under its flag. Uh, uh, Ephraim under its flag. Manasseh under its flag. Reuben under its flag. Dan under its flag. Each tribe is camping under its flag. In Numbers 10, they march in specific order. Judah goes first and then a couple tribes behind him. And then Ephraim goes next. And then the tabernacle and then Reuben. There's a pattern and each tribe marches with its flag and its standard and its banner. <clears throat> According to ancient, and we look in in, in Numbers chapter 2, you can see the layout. The Bible tells us where the tribes were in the east and the south and the west and the north. And ancient uh, Israelite tradition, rabbinical tradition, and, and those who have done researching of the documents and the, the, the information we know about ancient Israel, those banners, tradition, ancient Jewish tradition says those banners, the tribe of Judah, the flag, the image on the flag, the banner for the tribe of Judah was a lion, a white flag with a green lion, Judah would go with the constellation of Leo the lion. Reuben would go with the, the water barrier. His flag had an image of a man, almost often a man pouring water out of buckets, a red man on a white flag. Ephraim was an ox, a gold ox on a black flag, and Daniel was an eagle carrying a snake 
on a white eagle carrying a snake on a red flag. Now, if you go back and you remember what that picture of the constellations look like, these are not in the right order. The eagle and the ox should be opposite each other, and the lion and the man should be opposite each other. But if you do your reading in the, in the book of Genesis, you'll find out that Reuben slept with his father's concubine. He slept with his, his stepmom's aunt, sister, his, his aunt, essentially, his brother's, his half-brother's mother. And as a result, he lost the rights of the firstborn. He was demoted and he lost his position opposite of Judah and was demoted to the position where we find him on this map. So Ephraim and Manasseh actually swap positions from where they should have been, but this is where they're positioned in the description as they march and camp in the desert. Later on in the book of Numbers, Numbers 24, Israel is marching through the desert. They come up in the, the kingdom of Moab, and the king of Moab freaks out because the Israelites are coming through, and he's worried that they're going to destroy him. So he hires this guy, Bal Balaam, to come, and uh, Balaam was a guy who chanted and did all kinds of blessings and curses, and he hires Balaam to come and, and pronounce a curse on the Israelites. Two times in a row, he tries. God controls his tongue, and God only allows him to bless. The third time, he, uh, King Balak takes him up on a mountain, and he's looking over the tribe of Israel, camp by camp. Third time, Balaam is going to try to pronounce a curse on Israel for King Balak, who, Balak, who's hired him to do that. And Numbers 24 says, Balaam lifted up his eyes and saw Israel camping tribe by tribe in their camps, in their groups as tribes with their standards. And this picture is a drawing from the 1600s, a wood carving from the 1600s. And you can see each camp, so whether it's historically accurate or not is, is questionable, but it's, it shows each camp with their flag, their banner. And if we keep reading, the Spirit of God came upon Balaam and he took up his discourse and he's got this little litany that he starts saying in order to get himself into the mood, get him kind of into his trance so he can start making a prophecy. So the Oracle of Balaam, son of Baor, he goes falling down, having his eyes on covers. Verse 5, he starts to say his prophecy. How fair are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel. Like valleys that stretch out like gardens before the river. He's looking out over the valley and sees this huge campground of people with all these tents and these flags, these banners. As he looks over, in the next verse, what he sees first is the flag of the standard of Reuben. The image of a man associated with the constellation Aquarius. And he says, water shall flow from his buckets. His seed shall be by many waters. This is a, a picture here of a depiction of the constellation Aquarius from the Middle Ages. But it shows a man pouring water out of two buckets. In English, we have singular and plural. Bucket, one, and buckets, more than one. In biblical Hebrew, there's a word for bucket, one, a word for two buckets, and a word for more than two buckets. This word in Numbers 24-7 is the word for two buckets. Water shall flow from his two buckets. If we go back in ancient history and look at what the Egyptian and Babylonian depictions of the constellation Aquarius were from their temples where they have these drawings of what these constellations look like, they always show a man pouring water out of two buckets. That's the flag. Balaam shifts his glaze and next thing he sees is Ephraim, the standard of Ephraim with an image of an ox, the constellation Taurus, and he says, the next verse, God brings him out of Egypt. He is for him like the horns of a wild ox. Okay. Then he looks over and sees Judah's tribe and the flag bearing a lion, the constellation Leo, and he says, he couches, he lies down as a lion, as a lioness, who dares rouse him? Blessed is everyone who blesses you and cursed is everyone who curses you. And at this point, King Balak gets really angry because this is not what he had paid for. He starts chewing out Balaam saying, I paid for you to curse the Israelites and all you've done is bless them. And Balaam says, dude, I can only say what God tells me to say. One more chance. He slips back into his trance. He goes through this litany, the oracle of Balaam, the son of Bear, the oracle of the man whose eyes is opened, uh, falling down, having his eyes uncovered. He gets into his trance, and the next thing he says is, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob. A scepter shall rise from Israel and shall crush through the forehead of Moab. We've seen three of the four flags. Where is he looking? He's looking at the fourth flag, the tribe of Dan, which holds an eagle bearing a snake. Now, several hundreds of years later, when the Jews are in Babylon, they come out of their captivity in Babylon, a tradition starts coming around in their writings and their interpretations of scripture as they're going back and revisiting this passage from Numbers. A tradition comes out in the prediction that this a new star, but this passage in Numbers is saying that a new star would appear in the sky 
and I don't know where they got the two years from, but they came up with this prophecy that a new star would appear two years before the arrival of the Messiah. So, let's look and see, are there any, historically we can check this out, are there anything happening in the sky in the eagle constellation that we now know as Scorpio, appearing two years before 3 to 2 BC, and I am excited and disappointed because there's absolutely nothing. There is nothing in Scorpio during this time period. But, by the time of Jesus, Scorpio was no longer recognized as an eagle carrying a snake. It was a scorpion. So the, there would be no need to look there. There is another eagle constellation. There is an eagle constellation that is right next to a big snake in the sky. And if the Magi, aware of this prophecy in Daniel, the, from Daniel's teachings, from the book of Numbers that describes a star coming out of Jacob, if they knew the tribes in Israel arranged by their cramp grounds, they were looking for something to happen in a constellation that would represent an eagle, but they also knew that Scorpio was no longer an eagle, they might be looking in the constellation Aquila. And this is maybe far-fetched, but there are some things that happen in this constellation in the right time period. The ancient Chinese and Koreans were phenomenal astron astronomers and astrologers keeping track of things. For hundreds and hundreds of years, it, with the Europeans and the people in the Middle East would see a comet and they would freak out and go inside and run and cry and, and wail and complain because the world was going to end if a comet came through the sky. And what the Chinese and the Koreans were doing was simply writing it down. Here it is. Here's how big it is. Here's what direction it points. Here's where it's going. The next night it moves over. They were keeping meticulous records of what was going on while the Europeans were freaking out that the world was coming to an end. This is a Chinese star map from the time period of about 4, four to 5 BC, what the Chinese the, their constellations were different than ours, um, but this is what their map was. And in the constellations that they have names for, which correspond to our constellation, Aquila the Eagle, there are some things that happen. So this is a modern picture of what the star map looks like for us. Aquila is this constellation right here, not too far from Capricorn. Right off to the side here off screen is the Ophicius, which is the snake bearer, the man who holds the snake. So you've got an eagle right next to a snake. The Chinese records, Chinese astronomical records in the year 5 BC report something that showed up near the tail end of Capricorn and remained visible for more than 70 days. Something near this time period. They called it a Hu Sing, a broom star, a sweeping star. It's a word that they used to describe comets that have long tails that move through the sky as they, as they travel. In the year 4 BC, both the Chinese and Korean records show that there was something else that appeared near the constellation that we know as Aquila, and they called it a Posing, a bushy star, sparkling star, scintillating star, ray star. It's a word that is sometimes used for comets, but also used for bright stars. Tycho Brahe's famous supernova of 1572 that was visible in daylight for over a year is identified in the Chinese records as being a Posing. In other words, there could have been a bright star in this constellation that the Chinese recorded in the constellation of an eagle two years before the time period we're looking for. Italian astronomer, one of the books on my shelves in my library, The Star of Bethlehem by Mark Kidger. Mark Kidger is uh, an Italian astronomer. He's now associated with the, uh, the observatory that uh, the Vatican controls and uh, all the records of the, the library in the Vatican. He has done some research and he has believed that he believes that he's identified a recurring nova, a star that every few thousand years bursts off, slugs off its outer layer of gas in a massive explosion that would have been visible for months at a time. And he believes he's identified that star somewhere in a location right between Aquila and Capricorn, right in the region of the sky where the Chinese say that this thing happened in 4 BC. If this is all there was, it's, it's an interesting book, and he leaves it there and says, oh, this might, might be what it is. If that's all there was, I would say, oh, cool, maybe, but and not much more. Well, there is evidence that this was observed, not just because some guy sat in a computer and figured out where things were, but it was actually observed in history. Earlier I mentioned this Priscilla Catacombs catacombs in, in Rome, burial underground. There are a number of, of frescoes and sculptures in the wall, and one of the most famous sculptures in this, in this catacombs, dating from about 8200, is the Good Shepherd motif. The Jesus in the center here with a lamb on his shoulders and two sheep down below, a couple of trees on either side. This has been heavily damaged. It was repaired just a few years ago. Here's a photograph of what it looks like um, just after it's been repaired. 
good shepherd standing between two trees in a garden. And then on top of this, there's a painting. So there's this kind of decorative stuff on the top. There's a little bit of decoration at the bottom. There's some, somebody painted some little branches and fruit in the trees. And then over here, if you have to turn your head sideways, there's a picture of a guy and a woman and a baby. And if I just pull that image out for you, what it is, is a man holding a scroll, pointing at a, his finger at a pointy, sharp object in the sky next to a woman who's holding a baby. In other words, here's a man holding a scroll, pointing at a star, and there's a woman giving, holding a newborn baby in her lap. This, it's a well-known uh, picture, sculpture in this, in this catacombs, but in 1980, a woman by the name of Carol, Carolyn Beeler and a friend of hers, Dorothy Hostet, um, Dorothy was a, a PhD student in astronomy um, at the time, and they were on vacation in, in Rome going through these catacombs and took a bunch of photographs and then went back and looked at it. And Dorothy, because of her knowledge of the stars and constellations, because of her work that she was doing in astronomy, noticed that there's a pattern to all these little fruit. And she sat down and started drawing things on her hand, and she noticed that if you take these little red dots of fruit and you connect the dots in the right way, you get a star map. Let me just go back and forth between that picture. This is something I'm showing you here. I've only seen this one in one. It was, a, it was in a Smithsonian magazine, a very obscure uh, picture photograph, including the Smithsonian magazine, 1980. I've only seen this in one other very obscure book. Mark Kidger and his book about uh, the, the constellation where he shows this star that he believes was the, the thing that was seen in 4 BC by the Chinese and Ukrainians. He doesn't seem to know anything about this. So what you're seeing tonight is stuff that not you're not going to find in any other book that I'm aware of that I've seen yet. This map... This painting on top of a sculpture in a 200 AD catacombs is a map of the stars. And if I compare that map to the actual star map, so Andromeda, Pegasus, the flying horse, Cygnus, the swan, Ophicus, the snake bear, here's Aquila, the eagle. Here's the same things, Andromeda, Pegasus, Aquila, Ophicus. If this little object right here that this man in this painting is pointing to is the star, that puts it almost exactly where Mark Kidger says this, the Chinese and the, and the um, Koreans observed this object. Now we're not done yet, because what, what I think this is, this is the precursor. This is the answer to the question, a star shall come forth from Jacob. A new star in the constellation Aquila that matches the prophecy that Balaam was proclaiming about the tribes of Judah, one who would rule, would come, his star would appear in the sign of Jacob. This is the sign that would tell the Magi two years and the Messiah is coming. Two years and the Messiah is coming. So what are we looking for? What is the thing that they actually saw. I know this is a long journey here. I hope you're sticking with me so far. I find this stuff fascinating. What I also find is that it fulfills history and scripture and science and puts it all together. We're almost done. Herod calls the Magi and finds out from them when the time that the star appeared. He sends them to Bethlehem and says, go and carefully search for the child. So when you found him, come and tell me so I can go worship him too. Having heard the king, the Magi went on their way, and lo, the star which they had seen in the east went before them until it came and stood over where the child was. I've already told you that this phrase, what they had seen at its, in the east, meant at its rising or when it rose. But these other two phrases went on before them and came and stood over. These are the ones that are hard to figure out. And this is the reasons that when we talk about the story of the Magi, we talk about this star that kind of floats through the air and somehow it's moving across the sky and there the wise men grab their bags and they grab on their camels or their horses and they ride across the desert following the star and then the star stops and shines and broadcasts and beams down over where the child was and they simply follow the path and look in the sky. The star straight up in the sky shining right down here. Oh, here's the baby right here. Okay. Those two phrases in Greek are used all the time in ancient Greek astronomy textbooks. The Greek historians, the Greek astronomers back in the time of Jesus, 300 years, the, the famous Greek astronomer Ptolemy, his Greek textbook on astronomy describes the retrograde motion of planets using these two phrases, went before them and came and stood over. What's retrograde motion? If you go out every night and take a photograph or just look at the sky every night, at the same time every night. While the earth is revolving around the sun, the sky pattern is changing. What we see in the night changes. So if you went out and looked due south every single night at midnight, every single night, what you would notice every night is that gradually over time, the star map, what you see in the sky, tends to move. It goes from left to right while 
the earth is revolving around the sun. What you see on the opposite side of, at nighttime, the earth, the sun's on the other side. I'm showing you a picture that's slightly different here because I wanted to catch this Jupiter-Saturn conjunction. This is what we would see if we started watching in about June, going through to tonight, every night at the same point in time at 7 o'clock at night. I go outside and look at the stars and see what it is. This whole pattern moves across the sky from left to right. We call them stars. The planets in the ancient world were called wandering stars because planets do the opposite. While the entire star pattern moves from left to right across the screen, actually for you I think this is left to right across the screen, from left to right across the screen, the planets are going the opposite direction. The planets go from right to left in the opposite direction of what the stars are doing. But then they reach a point, planets, all the planets do this, they reach a point where they stop going in the opposite direction, they turn around and go in the same direction as the stars at night are moving, or appear to be moving, that's called retrograde motion. Then they turn around and go back in their original direction. It's kind of like a zigzag pattern. If you were to go and watch every single night and plot and map out and find out where the planets are going, the planets move, compared to the background of stars, the planets move over and back and over again. The reason for that is because as our planets are orbiting the sun, they rotate and orbit at different speeds. And so in this case, Earth rotates, revolves, orbits the sun faster than Jupiter does. And so there's a period where it looks like Jupiter is moving in the same direction, opposite, and then it backs up and then it goes forward. So if I try to time this, it's going opposite direction, retrograde with the stars, opposite direction again. And it'll do that several times during the time period of, of an orbit, depending on exactly how things line up. So this retrograde motion is something that happened to the stars. And actually, this is something that took us a long time to figure out. The early model of the universe where the Earth was at the center of the, of the solar system and all the sun and all the planets revolved around it could not explain this. One of the reasons why Copernican, the Copernican theory that the sun is the center of our solar system works is because it's the only way we can explain this motion that we see in the night sky. All right, in 3 and 2 BC, there is a fascinating sequence of events involving retrograde motion of Jupiter, Venus, and the star Regulus in the constellation Leo. This is a sculpture that is it's heavily defaced now. This is a photograph taken in the late 1800s. Um, nowadays, in, in modern, it's in a region in uh, Turkey, north of, of Jerusalem, north of Syria. This, this sculpture has been completely defaced. The face of the line is gone. Both of his legs are broken off. You can hardly see anything anymore, but this this sculpture has a star map on it with planets and stars and is showing a very spectacular event that happened in about 2 BC. All right, we know, I already showed you this page, that the, the Magi were looking at the stars. They know that the stars were there. They were looking at events like this. So let me show you what happened in the night sky between 3 and 2 BC in the constellation of Leo the Lion, which is corresponding to Judah, the tribe of Judah. Jupiter in ancient times was the king planet. This little bright star that you can't quite see here at the one of the feet of Leo the Lion is the star Regulus. Regulus is a Latin word. It means royalty. This is the king. Jupiter is the king planet. The star Regulus right here, this bright spot, the Regulus star in, Ju in the, the constellation Leo is the king star. King planet, king star. This yellow line just shows the path that Jupiter is going to follow. And I've created this animation to freeze the sky so that we can watch Jupiter move. As I step through this animation, Jupiter is moving along and Venus is coming along. And Jupiter and Venus have a very close conjunction, kind of like what we're hopefully seeing tonight with Jupiter and Saturn, in the constellation Leo before the feet of Leo in 3 BC. Jupiter keeps moving. Jupiter approaches the constellation um, Leo, gets really close to Regulus to start, but just before that happens, I'm going to come back to this, but something special happens on September 11th, no relation to what happened in the U.S. in 2001. September 11th, 3 BC, the sun is in the constellation Virgo. The moon is at Virgo's feet. We'll come back to that. A couple days later, Jupiter, the king planet, and Regulus, the king star, have a very close conjunction in the constellation Leo. Jupiter keeps moving in its normal direction. And it eventually reaches the point where it pauses. If I get there, the animation will keep up with me. There it is. Jupiter reaches its first stationary point and begins to go retrograde motion, which according to Greek astronomy texts, uses the phrase, went before them. Jupiter is now going in the direction 
as the same direction that the regular stars in the background are going. There is a second conjunction between Jupiter and Regulus, the king star and the king planet. Then Jupiter reaches its other extreme point. And this is bogging. My computer is, is pausing. Here we go. Jupiter reaches the second stationary point, And this is the one where astronomers in ancient Greece and the ancient Greco-Roman world would say that this star, this planet, stood over them and then resumes its normal motion. And as it's resuming its normal motion, it keeps going. Here comes Venus again. Venus comes in. And Venus and Jupiter have another conjunction between the feet of Leo the lion. And then it keeps going. And there's a massing of all these planets. And this massing of planets where all the planets, almost all of the visible planets except Saturn, were visible in the sky at the same time. All right. This first Jupiter-Venus conjunction on August the 12th of 3 BC occurred just before sunrise, just as Jupiter and Venus are coming above the horizon early in the morning, just before the sun came up. This would have been observed at its rising as it rose, the conjunction just as it rises above the horizon before the feet of Leo the lion, constellation Leo, the king planet, Virgo is the, the Venus is the mother planet, the king planet and the mother planet in the constellation of Leo, the lion of Judah. The second conjunction of Jupiter and Venus, Jupiter, the king planet, Venus, the mother planet in the constellation of Leo. This one occurred at night just after the sun went down. So this one they actually see looking west. The other one you saw looking east at sunrise. This conjunction you would see looking west towards Bethlehem, towards Jerusalem, if the, pa the Magi were in Parthia. This one occurs between the feet. There's a passage in, in Genesis that talks about um, the scepter not departing from the feet of the lion, possibly a reference to this occurrence. This particular conjunction was even more spectacular than the one that I'm not able to see tonight because of the clouds. This conjunction was a conjunction between Jupiter and Venus. The two brightest objects in the night sky were even closer than Jupiter and Saturn were tonight. Compared to the size of the moon, the scale Jupiter and Venus almost looked like they're touching. In fact, if you blew it up and looked through a telescope, it would look as if the two of them were almost touching each other. It would have been such a bright object in the sky, brighter than anything else in the constellation, Leo the Lion, Tribe of Judah, King Planet, King Star. The King Planet and the King Star Regulus have had a triple conjunction. The King of Kings and Lord of Lords in the constellation Judah. It doesn't get much better than that. I mentioned this thing on September 11th, 3 BC. There's an interesting thing that happens. It's hard to see. This happened during the daytime, so it would have been difficult to see, impossible to see. Astronomers would have known that it was going on. At least if we were sitting on Earth, it would have been hard to see. The sun is in the middle of the constellation Virgo, the Virgin. Let me turn the lights off just so you can see what's going on. The sun is closed in Virgo, in the middle of Virgo. The moon down here is at the feet of Virgo. The book of Revelation chapter 12 the Apostle John is called up into heaven and sees some miraculous visions and strange things that he's seeing. He sees a sign in the heavens. A woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. I would like to believe that John was elevated from earth out into space and is seeing a panoply of astronomical events happen. He sees the sun in the constellation Virgo, the moon at her feet, 12 stars, either the stars in the constellation or the 12 zodiac around. This woman is in, in labor with child pregnant. She cries out being in labor. Verse 5, John tells us that she gave birth to a male child, the one who is to rule all the nations. This is obviously imagery that John sees that is talking about the birth of Jesus. He sees it as acted out in the heavens. This is going on in the middle of that conjunction of Jupiter and, and Venus in the constellation Leo that the wise men, the Magi, would have been seeing and identifying as a king to be born in Judah. September 11th, 3 BC, was just a few days before the Feast of Tabernacles. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 14, tells us that the word became flesh God became human and dwelt among us. And what's so cool about this verse <clears throat> is that the word dwelt in Greek is actually the word tabernacled. 
the word became flesh and dwelt among us. I don't know, was John telling us in his hidden language that Jesus was born in September of 3 BC when the sun was clothed, a woman was clothed with the sun, the moon at her feet, and 12 stars, while Jupiter and Venus are conjuncting in the sky in the constellation Leo, two years after a new star burst forth in an, an eagle constellation to signify that something amazing and special is happening. Here's the summary of what I think. Again, you won't find this in a book. I'm, I'm putting this all together from all the different options and features, trying to match scripture with what I know from history and what I know from happened in the sky. This is, the, I think, to me, the story that's told. In 4 BC, there's a new star bursting forth in Aquila the Eagle that satisfies the, the prophecy out of Numbers. It says a new star will burst forth, come forth out of Jacob. Mark Kidger, the astronomer, has found the star. It appears on a painting in the catacombs, in the ceiling of the catacombs. It appears to be a star map, an ancient drawing of the skies hidden in this painting, hidden in this sculpture. That's what he saw. And the wise men, the magi, saw this, and they started looking. And they saw a, a series of very close conjunctions between Jupiter and Venus, the king and the mother, in the constellation Leo, associated with the tribe of Judah, the king star and the king planet, the king of kings. They see a constellation, this, this conjunction as it rose. And then the second conjunction is just after the star Jupiter. The planet Jupiter has gone before them and came and stood over through its retrograde motion. And it says they came to the house. And they saw the child, this toddler, with Mary his mother, and they fell down and they worship him. Opening their treasures, they present to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Who? Parthian astrologers. When? 2 BC. Where in the sky they were looking at an eagle constellation and the tribe of Judah, Leo the lion. What? This triple constellation. There's one more question I got to ask. And that's why. Why, why does this matter? I'm sorry, I, I often get choked up when I get to this part of the story because this is such a cool, to me, such an amazing series of events in history, in the sky and the stars, in biblical prophecy to put this all together. Why does this matter? You go outside. We don't, I don't get to do this. I live in a town where there's lots and lots of lights and lots and lots of trees. We have so much light pollution. It's been such a long time since I can see the stars. I'm envious of my aunts and uncles up in Canada in, in a farm with no trees, and they can see the sky. My sister was up in northern Minnesota, and they can go outside and see the Milky Way galaxy at night. I look up, and I'm lucky if I can see one or two stars in the moon occasionally with all the clouds that we have. Romans 1, 20 says that... What has been known about God is plain to us because God has shown it to us. His invisible attributes, his eternal power, divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that we are without excuse. In other words, we look at the stars, we look at nature, we look at this and we are without excuse if we don't believe the God who says he put them there. Psalm 19 says... The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. But it's not speech with words. There's not a voice that's heard. It's simply the sky is telling the glory of God. David would have been able to look up and see the stars and the Milky Way galaxy at night. He would have been able to see these things. In Psalm 8, David writes, O God, O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name. When I look at your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you would care for him? David looked up and said, I see this in the sky. And I can't help but ask, why would you care? Sorry. Why would you care about us? And David didn't see half of it. In 2003, astronomers pointed the Hubble Space Telescope towards a tiny black patch of sky just off to the, the Big Dipper. This is a, 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 a black region where there were no visible stars at this point in space. 
at this location. The size of this little red dot is exaggerated on this picture. It's about as small as the size of a pinhead. If you were holding your hands out at arm's length, looking at the size of a pinhead, that's the amount of area in the night sky that the Hubble telescope was looking at. They pointed it at that tiny, tiny black, black point in space and took photograph after photograph after photograph of the photograph for three months. They collected photographs to make a high, an incredibly high resolution of this empty black region of space. And what they saw when they developed the photograph was this. These dots, these white splotches, these colors, greens and blues and reds, those are not stars. Every single one of those dots, every single one of those colors is a galaxy. This little tiny head of a pin sized area in space contains over 10,000 galaxies in that picture. Astronomers currently estimate that there are between 100 and 200 billion galaxies in the entire universe. Our Milky Way galaxy, the one that our solar system inhabits, the Milky Way galaxy is a small galaxy. We only have about 300 billion stars in our galaxy. I can't do that math. You take 300 billion stars, 500 billion stars per galaxy, and there's 100 to 200 billion galaxies in the universe. That's what God put out in the night sky. God took one of those, of all those billions and billions and billions of galaxies, he took one galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, and he put a solar system in it. Around that solar system, he put nine planets, eight planets, and one of those planets, he put life on it. And God chose to invest himself on the life that he put on that one planet, in that one solar system, in that one galaxy out of billions and billions and billions and billions. And he sent us his son and he wrote his word. And it's even more amazing because Ephesians tells us that before he made the world, God loved us past tense and he chose us past tense in Christ. Before God put that out in place, he chose you. He chose me. First Peter 1.20 says, God chose him, Jesus, as your ransom long before the world began. Christmas, we celebrate the baby Jesus and we do lots of other things, Santa Claus and presents and Christmas trees and stuff. God sent Jesus to come as a baby so he could live life as a human. He lived life as a perfect human, but he lived his life for one, one specific purpose and one purpose only, and that was so he could be crucified on a cross to pay the penalty as a sacrifice to pay the penalty for your sin and my sin. That's the reason he came. And God did not do that as a band-aid fix after Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. He didn't do this as a band-aid fix to try, oh, humans screwed up, I got to fix something. He put that into place before the world began. Before he threw the stars out into space, he had chosen one of those stars to have the earth orbiting around it. In a clockwork mechanism that is more accurate than the grandfather clock you may have sitting in your living room. Orbiting, orbiting, orbiting with a precision that is amazing. So we can go back in time and figure out where every object in that point of that solar system was at any point in time. He put that there. And not only that, he put a, another star in some distant galaxy, perhaps, that went nova at just the right time so the light traveling for hundreds of thousands of years would come and appear in the eyes of some magi here. We're looking up at a constellation. It would appear to be coming from the constellation Aquila. That clockwork mechanism of Jupiter and Venus and Earth around the sun just happened to be working out exactly so that there was a constellation in the, in the constellation, a, a, a conjunction in the constellation Jupiter, a, constell, a conjunction of Jupiter and Venus in the constellation of Leo at just the right time so the Magi would see it and they would come to worship the baby that's born. This, this other verse in Galatians is so much more real to me after all the studying I've done. It says, when the fullness of time had come, God worked through history. Romans and Parthians, Magi, Kings, Herod, all the things had to come into play just right so that everybody, Caesar Augustus, had to rule at just the right time so that his 25th anniversary would require Joseph and Mary to come down to Bethlehem. At the same time that Jupiter and Venus are moving through the sky in the constellation. Everything in the fullness of time. And what's even more amazing, John's Gospel and Hebrews both tell us that God created the universe through Jesus. In other words, <laughs> the one who created it 
created the very star that pronounced his own birth. I, I find that amazing. All right, so what? Who cares? This is cool. You sat with me for an hour and almost 40, almost, almost two hours. You've been listening to me. I don't know, 45 minutes listening to me talk about all this history. Really fascinating, cool. Let's go get some hot chocolate and open up presents around the tree. What's the response? There are three responses to this story that you can walk away with. One of them is you can be like Herod. Herod, if you read the rest of the account in Matthew's Gospel, Herod was terrified, troubled when the Parthian Magi showed up. He was the king by appointment, and he was very paranoid to the point of murdering his own sons and his favorite wife because he thought they were trying to take the kingdom away from him. And when this Parthian envoy comes through announcing the fact that there is a Magi, there's a new, the Magi are coming in announcing the fact that there's a newborn king of Judea, king of the Judeans, Herod's response is to try to do everything he can to murder him. You read the story, he, he kills every baby in Bethlehem, two years old and younger, to try and eliminate this option. We sometimes have that reaction. Who is God to tell me what to do? Who is God to mess up and get in my life? This has been a hard year. I, I've been teaching online since March, nine months. I've been working out of my house. My students are taking classes from their homes. People are losing their jobs. People are dying because of this virus. We've had a contested election. We've got people arguing and yelling and screaming at each other and losing friendships over who voted for who. And we can say, well, God, I hate you. Why would you do this? Why would you allow this to happen? We can oppose God. Who cares about this? We can be just like Herod. Other people in the story, if you read the rest of the account in Matthew, were the priests, the Pharisees, the chief priests, the religious leaders who should have known what this was all about. They knew that the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem. They told Herod, yeah, the Messiah is to be born in Bethlehem. And you know what's amazing? Is that they never went. They knew from their scriptures that the Christ, the Messiah, would be born in Bethlehem. There are Parthian Magi, the heroes to rescue and release Israel from their captivity, are looking for a newborn king, and they're going to go to Bethlehem to find him, and the priests could not care less. They never, ever, ever show up and go. It amazes me. So it's really easy for us at Christmas. We get so busy, bogged down with everything else. We care more about the gifts and the presents and the tree and Santa and all the things going on with our lives. We really don't care about Jesus or about God or about the Savior or the need for it. It's easy to be indifferent. However, the response that we need to have, that I hope you have after watching this tonight, is one of, one of worship. The Magi saw the star. They traveled to come and welcome this new king. They saw, they knew what it meant. They interpreted it as being something special. They knew the scriptures. They knew this was the fulfillment of what had been foretold in ancient scriptures. They came following the star, and they came and they saw this child. And it says, they bowed down, they worshiped their gifts, they gave him their gifts, and they worshiped him. That's my prayer and hope for you, is that you would respond to this whole story as, God, you are amazing. In fact, I'm just going to end with, with thanking God myself for that. God, you are an amazing God. This, this story I find fascinating for so many reasons. The history, the science, the, the, the Bible theology behind it all. But the fact that you did all this just because you wanted us to know that your son was here. And the, the reason you sent your son before you created the world you sent your son. You, you guaranteed your son to be our sacrificial replacement. To pay the penalty for our sin so that we could have a personal relationship with you. God, I can't help but fall down and worship. The God who created the stars. The God who put this in place. The God who gave me his word. The God that put the science and the laws of our universe together so that we could discover this. God, you are the one that Christmas is about and you are the one that we worship. You are the one that I worship. Thank you for doing this, for telling us, for giving us people so much smarter than me who've been able to put all this down in books and papers so that I could dig through it all and put it all together. Thank you for telling us this story. Amen.